the fivefold ministry gifts or the ascension gifts ascension when the lord ascended to heaven ephesians 4 11 through 13 we start with verse 8 and when he christ ascended up on high he gave gifts unto men and he gave some apostles some prophets evangelists pastors teachers for the perfection of the saints the work of the ministry the edifying of the body of christ Till we all come into unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man, uh, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. Some scholars uh, share that in verse 8, when it says that he gave gifts unto men, that if it's transliterated from the Greek, it can also read he gave men as gifts, which means these offices five offices are gifts that the Lord Jesus gave to the church, to the body of Christ, to establish it and build it up since he was now ascending to his Father in heaven. Again, uh, there is a divide between fundamentals and charismatic Pentecostals. Uh, the fundamentals also dispensationalists or cessationists. They believe that you don't anymore have the offices of apostle and prophet functioning in the church today, but the latter three uh, evangelist, pastor, teacher are. So how really do we come up with that to maybe fit our theological or doctrinal box? And please know, I, I sincerely believe from life experience and from scripture that uh, just because somebody may be functioning in an apostolic gift, that is traveling, pioneering different countries, establishing churches like the Apostle Paul, that doesn't mean they're going to take the place of one of the original 12. That's secure. But it's just that this person's functioning in an apostolic capacity or in a prophetic capacity foretelling what God has put on their heart uh, for an individual or local church. So please know that it doesn't. it's not to displace anybody else. That's taken care of. Uh, I mean, a simple example, take our mother, your mother and mine. She'll never take the place of Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus. But that doesn't stop your mother and my mother from being wonderful mothers. But Mary, the mother of Christ, eh, she's blessed among women. All right. So those apostles, their spots are secure. All right. So um, the apostolic ministry, though, is a bit heavy duty. I would be wary if someone said, I'm apostle so-and-so or I'm prophet so-and-so it's it's rather heavy duty I would be cautious about that before assuming such a title uh, and by the way as far as the 12 apostles go um, even though in Acts chapter 1 it says that the remaining 11 cast lots and Matthias was chosen to take the place of Judas many Bible scholars believe that God chose the apostle Paul to take Judas's place but we don't have to get into that We'll find out in heaven. It's not a problem. Now, I want us to touch on the historical case. We see clearly from the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, to the beginning, the Gospel of Matthew, New Testament, there was a 400-year gap, time period, where we don't hear of any apostles or prophets. No prophets. But there were prophets, many prophets before in the Old Testament. Malachi himself was a minor prophet. And suddenly in the New Testament, in Matthew's Gospel, there's John the Baptist who's a prophet. So though there was a 400-year hiatus, John the Baptist crops up as a prophet again. Now there's been 2,000 years since the time of Christ. I'm just proffering this as food for thought. So are we saying that in 2,000 years there could never be another single prophet, a man or woman who hears from God and can foretell, or another one, a person who functions in an apostolic capacity? So I just wanted to make that case from history. Uh, because how could we still accept evangelist pastors, teachers, but say, no, the other two are out. Uh, also, even with our modern day naming or nomenclature system, it seems that everyone's clumped together with, under one title of pastor. In actual fact, I am not a pastor. By real definition, I do not pastor, tend to, care for, uh, or I'm not an overseer or the shepherd of a local church or congregation. And neither have I been called to be one. By the way, 
tongue in cheek, here's a little laugh. What do we call a pastor uh, in the European city of Frankfurt? What would he be called? Answer, a German shepherd. All right. All right. That's pretty clever, I thought. So I'm called to be a teacher of the word of God. But do you ever hear Christians saying to me, how are you teacher Taylor? Or even in churches, I'm not usually uh, um, introduced as, now we invite teacher Taylor to come. <laughs> they say, Pastor Andrew. Somehow this pastor term has been used in a generic sense to cover them all, when technically speaking, it is inaccurate. Now, uh, we shared in the upload titled Nine Gifts of the Spirit about the prophet uh, foretelling how it's a valid gift in the body of Christ today, but it needs to be handled with greater caution, both in the exercising of the prophetic gift as well as anyone claiming such a title. God has and still does reveal certain things to those that flow in this particular gifting um, as a personal, real-life example, I personally, I would like to share something about both these apostolic and prophetic giftings with you that I have experienced. Now, don't worry, I'm not. I'm a teacher. But things that have been shared with me. So, many a time, as I'm speaking in a different church pretty much every Sunday in the year in different parts of the world, after the service, a pastor will come to me and say, Whoa! How did you know that that was going on in this church? How did you know the situation we were facing? That was right for that person or those people in our congregation. I said, I had no idea. But the Holy Spirit knew, you see. And then there have been some folk who said to me, You can't just say you're a teacher. You are a prophetic teacher. Not pathetic. Prophetic teacher. Now, I hear that, and I've heard that a few times, but I don't go around saying, I'm a prophet. I know I'm called of God, and dare I say, gifted by God, to be a teacher of his word. And I'll tell you why I believe that. But just because of a few people saying, you're a prophetic teacher, I don't get carried away with that. I know I'm not called to be a prophet in the body of Christ. And then about apostolic. As I preach in different churches and some people hear how God has enabled us to establish and pioneer Bible schools in different parts of the world, etc. Some of them have come to me and said, you may say you're a teacher, but you're an apostolic teacher. So why so? Because you've been into so many parts of the world, like the Apostle Paul went to so many parts of Asia Minor and Europe and he established churches and you've gone around and established. And I hear that. And I'm thinking, well, I understand geographically that may come under that description, but I don't get carried away. So be very careful before assuming titles of apostle and prophet. I know I'm called of God to be a teacher. And what's this point? We must learn to be content with the call that God has placed upon our life. Believer, stop chasing after something that you were not created to be. I am content to be a teacher of the word, regardless of what others may suggest to me. All right? Now you say, how do you know you're called to be a teacher? Well, when I was asked after teaching school, fine, you know, you do your qualifications, you love children, you like the subjects, but I'm talking about teacher of the word. When I was asked to teach adult Bible study classes, numerous, not one or two saying apostle or prophet, numerous people in the classes would come and say, and pardon me, I'm just quoting them, you are a gifted teacher. I could listen to you for hours. Why did you stop so quick? Things like this. When numerous people say that, there's a cloud of witnesses, multitude, then you got to realize all of them can't be wrong. And also, when I'm teaching, it's a great joy and fulfillment for me. So I've learned I need to be content with the call that God has placed on my life. Thank you, Jesus, you've called me to be a teacher. And by the way, if I try to pastor, as much as you may enjoy my teaching, you find out I may be a complete flop as a pastor. Don't squeeze one fivefold ministry gift into another mold, it, there can be disaster, and that's why so many pastors suffer burnout. 
and churches close because a certain fivefold ministry gift is being forced to function in multiple other ministry gift roles. All right, so let's uh, proceed. Let's look at the fivefold gifts and uh, watch the fingers of my left hand. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The apostolic gift is a very powerful gift. Again, think the Apostle Paul. Traveling different parts of the world, establishing churches and works and ministries. And the Apostle also has the authority and the ability to function oftentimes as prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Then you have the prophet. This is the prophetic finger. Imagine Nathan coming to David and challenging David about his adultery and murder and manipulation. And then Nathan says, Thou art the man. That's the appointing finger. He didn't say, Thou art the man. No. You are the man. You're the guilty. You're the one. You're the culprit. John the Baptist sees the Lord Jesus. He says to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God. So that's the prophetic finger pointing out by the Spirit of God. So apostolic, very powerful. Prophetic, very powerful. And then when you look at the fingers, you come to the evangelist. This is the tallest of all. The most wide-ranging scope. You think of evangelists who've uh, been around in our time, who've conducted crusades. Tens of thousands sometimes attend and hundreds upon hundreds give their lives to Christ. Tremendous scope. And evangelists can also sometimes function as pastor or teacher. Then you have the pastoral finger. What's special about this finger? Do you see that there? The wedding band? <laughs> this is called the heart finger. And the pastor has a shepherd's heart for his people. Shepherd's eye, shepherd's touch. He cares, he nurtures for them. And a pastor also can be a teacher of the word. And then you come to the pinky, the little finger, which symbolizes the teacher. Now, what am I called to be? A teacher. And I struggled with this in my early days in ministry. Lord, I'm just a teacher. I'm just a pinky. And then one day he ministered this in my heart. He said, Andrew, how can my people do what has been taught? Do my word if they don't remember what they heard. And so what's the teacher's job, the pinky? Are you ready for this? To dig the wax out of your ears. Clean the wax out of your ears. In Revelation, numerous times we read this in the Old King James. Let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Another translation, modern translation says, Let these sayings sink into your ears. So a teacher's job is to the little pinky to take clean the wax out of our ears. Because when we hear it, not in one ear, out the other. When we really hear it and it sinks in down into our heart, into our mind, we become responsible and accountable to do what we learned from the Word of God. So, I'm content to be a pinky and praise God for that. You, my dear friend, be content to excel in the calling that God has placed on your life. So, the apostle, he's more the overseer like a bishop. He has a panoramic overview of the overview of the universal body of Christ. The prophet is to speak to and challenge the church, keep us on our toes. The evangelist is involved in sweeping souls into the kingdom of God. The pastor is shepherding and nurturing and caring for the flock. And the teacher, I just said, is to clean the wax out of our ears, causing us to grow, become disciples, and mature in the word of God. Now, each of these gifts possesses a different measure of grace. The Greek word for measure is matron, a different measure of grace. If we forced, like I said, if you forced me as a teacher to be a pastor, you might be surprised. The same people who came and said, I love your teaching. I could listen for hours. But as a pastor, they might leave the church and say, this guy, he is not a nurturer. He doesn't care for us like the other pastor did. So that's why we have so much of burnout, sadly. So don't force one ministry gift into another role. But when we have the fivefold ministry gift functioning in unity in the body of Christ, then maturity of the believers will follow. And so the apostle, the Greek word is apostolos, apostolos. He is God's church builder, architect tone from which we get the word architect. 
architect, designer, builder, apostles in part, strategize, ordain. These are the fathers in the church, pioneers, trailblazers. Like we said, they have a global overview um, uh, and certainly a key part of the fivefold ascension gifts. They see the whole picture. They see the whole picture, whereas a pastor would be more focused on his local church. By the way, beware of school of the apostles. Of a pastor in Fiji who said he went to the U.S., to Hawaii, attended a school of the apostles. He came back, obviously, with a certificate. And he said to me, I'm actually an apostle now, brother. Please. <laughs> Going to... To church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. So either God has put that in us, that specific calling. You don't get it by attending and getting a certificate. Dear friend, beware of that. Of course, they take money for the course, you know. And then you come to the prophet. The Greek word is prophetes, prophetes. Prophets are ascension gifts or one of the fivefold ministry gifts that produce a hunger for the voice of God. Prophets see through the eyes of the Spirit, speak boldly, are mouthpieces, they reveal, proclaim, foretell, and they can even have dreams and visions. They announce God's will, unlock the mysteries of God's word. Prophets are spokespersons of God. Now beware of the school of the prophets. This is the problem in the charismatic Pentecostal circles. We have had many abuses and our precious fundamental friends say, look at that. No, let's be objective. We reject what's abusive. We reject what's over the top. But we hold fast to the true, pure, unadulterated word of God. School of the Prophets. In Australia, a certain team came from the USA. Conducting school of the prophets. Again, you had to pay some money to attend the school. And the regular believer thought, hey, I'd like to be a prophet or a prophetess. So they paid the fee. They attended the school. They were taught how to prophesy. Uh, I don't want to go into details. You know, we want to uphold with integrity the office of a prophet. Not talk about what these people did. And then they got the certificates. You can hang it up in your living room. So when visitors come, I'm prophet or prophetess so and so. It's like uh, an ego-boosting thing. And then, a couple of months after, because of course when you attend the school, they get your data. These people got a letter or whatever it was in the mail, a communication saying, $50 for your personal prophecy. Because by now things have cooled down a bit, you know. So $50, send us a gift and we'll send you your personal prophecy. And most people didn't respond. And guess what happened? They got another follow-up letter. Discount. 50% off, $25 for your personal prophecy. Can you see why our dear fundamental friends are running scared? But dear fundamental friends, we are going to be in heaven together as long as we are all washed in the blood of Jesus. Please don't let the excesses of a few chase you away from the genuine experience that is in the word of God. So please, don't take these titles of apostle and prophet lightly or too easily. It doesn't come by going to a school to obtain this title. Paying for it. Friend, I can pay. I forget about 250 US dollars to get an honorary fake doctorate. Does that make me Dr. Andrew Taylor, please? Just call me brother. I am your brother in Jesus Christ and fellow servant of our Lord God. But there's the genuine calling and the office of, a, of an apostle, of a prophet. Then you come to the evangelist. Evangelistes is the Greek word. Evangelistes. These are those who spread the good news of salvation through the cross. They focus on souls, salvation, the lost, the gospel, reconciliation. You know, without the evangelist coming through the body of Christ from time to time, we might even start to forget about the Great Commission. We become so comfortable and spiritually obese. Friend, there's a lost world once we leave that church door. They need to come to Jesus. So praise God for the evangelist. You know the thing about an evangelist? They can preach from John 3, 16, time after time, wherever they go. And you ask, I ask people, so how was that evangelist uh, and that crusade? Oh, it was fantastic. What did he teach on? I don't know, but it was great. 
because they go through John 3, 16 each time. But that's their calling, that's their gifting to bring the lost in repentance to the cross of Calvary. Fourth, pastors, that's the ring finger. Poimen, P-O-I-M-E-N, the Greek, poimen. These are the shepherds. They're called to love and protect, nurture and care for the sheep, for God's people. Pastors, shepherd, nurture, tend, feed. Think of Psalm 23. He leads me beside still waters into green pastures. A comfort, lead, protect, guard. Pastors are of great benefit to the local church. In fact, they would be the pivot for that local church that the congregation look to for guidance and, and nurturing. Uh, they show much mercy, love and compassion. Pastors offer godly counsel, wisdom and advice. Pastors have a full plate. Believe me, I thank God he's not called me to be a pastor. And I salute and have the greatest respect for those who are called to be pastors in the body of Christ. Again, beware congregation, beware elders and leaders that you don't force your pastor into multiple fivefold ministry gift roles. You are there to fill those places, to fill in the pastor's weaknesses. Every human being has strengths and weaknesses. You be there to fill in the places where the pastor is not as strong and let him flow in his mean main key giftings. However, no matter how much the pastor does to nurture us, we need more than just compassion and love. We also need to become disciples of Christ. For that, we need the teacher, the pinky, the little finger. Didaskalos, didaskalos is the teacher. Teachers are set in the body of Christ to instruct us in the word of God. Teachers, <laughs> explain. I'm laughing because this is what I'm called to do. Explain, train, instruct, simplify so that we may grow and mature in God. Teachers have a genuine gift to break down scriptures into easily understood truths. After becoming born again, Believers need to be instructed in the word of God and the ways of God and to take us from, let's say, the initial church membership to maturity in Christ. And then we find out what our ministry giftings are. And then we pursue that mission with a passion and ultimately everything is to magnify our God. So the fivefold ministry gifts or the ascension gifts are to equip the saints of the body of Christ to bring us to maturity that we may become like Jesus and be complete in him. Thank you and God bless you.